lands and pay my respects to the elders, both past and present. Then I'd like to wish everybody a happy 40th birthday, or not everybody, but the AGHS, and welcome all members to tonight's event and the talk, which is a talk by Ian Innes, um, which we'll get to shortly. But before that, we'll have our AGM. And it's the first AGM on the Zoom platform. So this is really going to be quite brief, and it fleshes out the report that was sent to you by email, which has images, pictures, and lists of functions and works that we've been doing. And the AGM will be structured in that I'll give a, a report of the activities and what we've been doing. Well, sort of. The treasurer will present the audit or the financial papers. There'll be an election for people who want to join the executive committee and a re-election of one. Um, and then Ian will speak and we'll have a close. Christine will um, close the meeting at the end, or not the meeting, but the event. So as I said in my report um, in Branch Cuttings, this is truly our Annus Horribilis, and I just wanted to use that, I quite enjoy it, reference to the royalty. Um, the executive committee had so many great events planned some will be postponed, others rescheduled for next year or beyond, and some will be reformatted. But I'm thrilled to announce that from the COVID ashes, the AGHS Conference 2020 has now been postponed. Um, and we learned very recently that the three principal venues that um, we need are all available on a particular weekend. And I noticed that um, Lisa has put it on the website. At the weekend of the 10th, 11th, 12th of September, 2021, is now the new date for the AJHS conference that we've all worked very hard to plan. And now we have another 12 months to finesse. And it's been a top priority for the conference subcommittee, most of whom are also on the executive committee. So I wish to thank them all for their tireless dedication, um, hard work this year, a year which opened with great optimism. We were planning a conference, maintaining the branch equilibrium, planning events to mark our 40th anniversary, all in the face of what became an overwhelming or seemingly overwhelming challenge. After the committee, I'd like to acknowledge the National Management Committee, especially the National Co-Chair, Stuart Reid, and other members of the NMC, who have been engaged and extremely supportive in providing guidance and assistance as we work together to face the challenge. Lisa Tuck, in particular, has been unshakable <laughs> and um, I look forward to Christine Hayes' um, conclusion this evening. So when I looked through the record of events that were planned for this year, I was so pleased to see how early um, we had developed our calendar of events. Usually we're <laughs> really very reactive, but um, we had it all planned, we had people allocated, and we were ready a year to celebrate 40 years of garden history. And as I said, the events projects and advocacy are listed in the report. But one standout for me anyway, was the presentation by Stuart Reid, Avenues of Honour. And not only for its um, content, but it was the first branch venture onto the webinar platform that we're using tonight in a sense. Um, and such a success if we had more than 60 people uh, who joined the presentation. And what I found wonderful was that faces not usually seen at Observatory Hill at the National Trust headquarters were able to join in. And an event that was created to meet the challenge of distance proved to be a great opportunity to reach members across New South Wales. And Queensland. Oh, were there people from Queensland? So, particular <laughs> highlight for me, and there is a wonderful picture, 
in the thing is that um, late last year at the National and Australian Institute of Landscape Architects Awards, the Ayla Landscape Heritage Conservation Listing Project received the President's Award. And the study was authored by Colleen Morris, Christine Hay, and myself. And the wonderful thing about this society is that I met both Colleen and Christine through the AGHS. And the President's Award recognized outstanding individual contributions to the profession, Ayla, or to the, product, or the, to the practice of landscape architecture or urban design. And the award is presented by the national president, but it's only awarded on merit. It's not an annual award. So it was really an amazing thing to be part of and a great honor to receive. So that for me was a highlight. Um, the Northern New South Wales sub-branch, like us, had fewer um, uh, events and functions, but they did celebrate their 15th anniversary of being a sub-branch of the um, New South Wales branch, and also 40 years as a, as a of the society. And they, they marked those events on the 15th of March, before COVID really had set in, I think. And the first was at, at a property called Terrible Vale. I don't know if that's a typo, but this comes <laughs> from, um, from directly from the northern branch near Urala. It's not a typo. It's not a typo. It's called Terrible Vale. Yeah. Okay, Terrible Vale. And uh, then they went on to Salisbury Court, which is the home of the Croft family, and um, first settled in 1850. And I think last year I, I visited that property and it is extraordinary. And at the, um, the event was Sir Owen Croft and um, he cut a celebration cake. And can you imagine what shape the cake took? <laughs> the Heritage Rose Garden at Somera's Homestead. Very appropriate and a great focus for the Northern Branch. And um, I note from um, their report that the branches put in two um, individual nominations to the National Trust Award, Heritage Awards next year. One for the educational value of stage two of the Heritage Rose Garden, and the second for the sustainable drought planting of Rosa Ragosa and Scoria Mulch that is the, on the new rosy roundabout entry to Armadale. Let's hope they're successful. Um, one project that they highlighted, which I think is extraordinary, is the old Teachers College um, in Armadale has three examples of former one teacher schools on the grounds. And my cousins who grew up in um, Narrabri were educated in a similar sort of um, building that was funded by local farmers. But anyway, Bill Oates um, and Graham Wilson um, from have researched school gardens dating back to the early 1900s. And they proposed establishing gardens similar to those in historic school photographs around the school museum buildings. The proposal includes involvement of local schools in the care and maintenance of the gardens. So I think that's an extraordinary, um, exciting project for them to be involved in. So all in all, in spite of COVID-19, We've had a, a trans, transformative year and the committee is probably exhausted. We're pivoting and planning for the future, almost spinning. So as this year I leave the committee, I would like to thank the AJHS community and myself for the privilege of chairing the committee for the last four years. So that is my report. Um, are there any questions about what we've done or haven't done. You have to unmute if you want to ask a question. Oh, goodness me. <laughs> Michael Ellis. Has Clive Lucas gone to heaven? <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah, it's, uh... No, you said to put us on mute. <laughs> You, you silenced us. I did. 
Okay. In heaven at the moment, yes. <laughs> so I propose that the report be accepted. Does anyone like to second it? I'll second it. It's Colleen. Thanks, Colleen. I recognise the voice. <laughs> so I'd like to call. I'd like to call on. Hello. I'd like to call on um, our treasurer, David Lowe, to share with you the financial statements and, and the audit. And he'll be sharing his screen. So don't be alarmed if everybody disappears. Okay, thank you, James. Um, I will just bring up the audited figures. Um, the Sydney, this is the AGM of the Sydney and Northern New South Wales branch of the Australian Garden History Society. Um, I'm sorry if you already know this, but Northern New South Wales have remained part of our branch, mainly because as such, they do not need a separate audit. Uh, the cost of the audit is uh, just over a thousand dollars. So by being part of us, we, we share that cost. Uh, so what you can see on the screen is part of the audited report, which I circulated to you. Uh, it's a spreadsheet. Uh, there are, well, the descriptions on the left. The second column is uh, Sydney branch, Northern New South Wales, total branch and the total branch last year. Um, I'll just flip down to the most important number on, on this surplus slash deficit row. You will see that the Sydney branch uh, made a loss of $350. Northern New South Wales made a profit of 6816 and uh, 6467 between us. Um, the reason Northern New South Wales made such a profit is that they have had considerable money coming in from various sources, mainly related to their heritage rose garden at Somares. And for a long time, the National Trust would not allow them on the property to do anything. Uh, so that's why there's funds are so, their profit is so high. They've got money in the bank that they haven't spent. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll just flick over to uh, this second screen shows the profit on each function. Uh, the branch needs to be self-funding. We don't get any money from head office. It's a very strange structure, but we won't go into that. Um, all the subs go towards head office and essentially the journal each branch has to pay their own way. So we try to make a profit on each function. You can see we've done that with various degrees of success. These two down here, the Eraldine function in March was canceled, but it is now going to occur, I think I can say it on the 6th of December, will be our Christmas party. The, the reason we've made a profit without even having the function is that the National Management Committee gave us $2,500 to put towards the 40th anniversary. And similarly, two rows further down, uh, that was for a harbour cruise. Uh, again, and National Management Committee gave us $2,500 that's been cancelled and we're still negotiating uh, what to do with that money. So basically that, that's it. Um, does anybody have any questions? Uh, if not, uh, I'd like to move that the annual financial report 
be accepted. It, it is audited. These numbers have been audited. They should be, they should be audited. Uh, do you want to take over, James, to uh, see if we have a seconder? You're muted, don't forget. I'm happy to second it, if, if there's no one else. Do you want to take off the shared screen, David? Oh, sorry. Okay, thank you. We've only got four minutes left, but the next part of the event is to... Um, the election of committee members. And this year, uh, uh, four members are not continuing. Um, Angela Lowe, Gina Plata, and myself have been on the committee now for 10 years. And the limit is nine, but we were given an extension in order to help with the um, <laughs> conference. Tempe Bevan, has been on for two terms of three. So she's been on for six years and she's not seeking re-election. Um, so I'm sure everybody would like to thank them for their service. Um, so under the society's constitution, rule 42, committee members hold office for three years accordingly it's not necessary for all members to stand for re-election each year. This year, no members remaining on the committee require re-election. Well, that's not quite true because David Lowe, God bless him, treasurer is a very hard to find, is going to be re-elected. So following committee members have observed one or two years of their existing three-year term and are not standing for election. And that includes Christine Hay, Steve Halliday, Susan Stratton, and Anne Smith. Have I forgotten anyone? Under the society's constitutional delegation, which creates branch committees of the National Management Committee and examining the practice of other branches, branch committee officers are elected by each branch committee at their next committee meeting after this AGM. So the Sydney branch will advise members of the outcome of that election in the next issue of branch cuttings. Now it's traditional and I don't think it's happened very often, but we would like to call for nominations from the room or from the Zoom. Um, is anybody interested in standing for the committee? James, John Moore, I'm happy to, um, to stand. Oh, lovely. Thank you. Well, I nominate John Moore. Anyone second John Moore? I will second that, James. I'll second it. Okay. <laughs> well, we say Mary Jane got in first. Or I okay. saw your Bye -bye. class. Um, well, there's a lot of people ready to second you, John, so that's great. Um, David Lowe was proposed by Robert Bolton and seconded by James Coyle. All in favour of David Lowe? Aye. Aye. Brilliant. So Aye. it is resolved that David Lowe be re-elected a member of the branch committee for a term of three years. Whether he stays for three, I'm not sure. But Now, Elder Estevez, who's been a wonderful contributor to the conference committee, was proposed by Stuart Reid and seconded by Susan Stratton. Um, all in favour? Aye. 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 Well, then it is resolved that Elder Estevez is elected a member of the branch committee for a term of three years. Congratulations to those people. And before closing the meeting, I'd like to just remind you that there's another webinar, which is also on our web page, but Glenda Corporal, who wrote a wonderful book about Marion I imagine it's a pronounced Mahoney being American. I would normally say Marnie, but um, Glenda Corporal wrote a book about uh, Marianne Mahoney and um, her relationship with Walter Burley Griffin. And she's giving a presentation called Marianne's Garden. So that's gonna be very exciting. That's in, on the 23rd of September. And then Angela Lowe is speaking about French gardens on the 21st of October. And lastly, the celebration as um, David mentioned for 
our 40th anniversary, which was to be held in um, earlier this year, I think March, and um, is going to be at Eraldine. So Christmas party and birthday cake. Um, and that's the 6th of December. So I would like to, at 7.21, that's not bad, advise that the, um, unless there's further business, does anyone have anything? Uh, to add? It's Colleen James. Okay. I would like to thank all of the retiring committee members. I know we've done lots of reactions, but I think it's, a, it's an enormous um, uh, contribution that you've all made. And especially, James, I know how difficult it is to be the chair and um, um, demanding. So I, um, I would very much like to thank you very much for your contribution to the society. Yeah. 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 Thanks to everybody. Thank, thank you. you, Gina. Thank you, James. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> suddenly my memory's failing. You can hear I'm not great. Okay, but to the four resigning members, I thank you most sincerely. From Paul and I. Evan here. <laughs> so um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening. And Ian Innes, for the past 10 years, has been Director of Heritage and Collections at, with Sydney Living Museums responsible for the conservation, I love this word, care and management of historic buildings, gardens and cultural collections. Before then, Ian had a long association with gardens and horticulture and landscape design practice in England, then at Sydney's Royal Botanic Gardens and later Central Parklands. He became interested in plants and gardening while studying architecture at university an obsession that led him along a completely unplanned career path with many adventures, like Alison in Wonderland, I imagine. It was at university that I met Ian. He and I are coeval. Mm -hmm. Might I have a bit of earth? Well, it was intriguing, so I Googled it. Uh -huh. um, I found its origins in chapter 12 of The Secret Garden, a favorite of mine, uh, a book written in uh, 1911 by the prolific and prodigious author Francis Hodgson Burnett. And at the core is the concept, I think, of the power of gardens to heal. I'm a believer. Mm. Welcome to Ian Innes. Please make him welcome. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to um, speak at your AGM, um, I really appreciate. I, um, I've done lots of speaking, but I've never spoken about myself before, so it feels a bit odd. So I, I hope I don't bore you to death. Um, if you get bored, there's lots of pretty pictures, so you can just look at the flowers and, in, and, and enjoy the ride. I'd also like to thank um, Steve and Halliday for inviting me to participate and uh, for his enthusiasm about my work, and uh, we work together a lot, and you're, you're very lucky to have him on your committee. Um, I, I might just pull this uh, PowerPoint up and share this with you so we can put some context to what I'm saying. Now, can you see that? Not Yes. Yes, yes. We can see that. <laughs> Are um, we all muted? The other thing I thought I'd like to do is sort of dedicate this talk to all those nutters, including myself and probably quite a few of you, who have um, succumbed to the lure of gardening and plants and ended up dedicating large chunks of your spare time and lives to growing plants or caring for plants and gardens. And over the years I've been involved in botanic gardens and other sites and garden societies. Of course, I've encountered um, thousands of people who've ended up uh, sucked into caring for a particular group of plants, like whether it be orchids or bromeliads or roses or begonias or cycads or palms. And it's astonishing that plants have this way of cajoling us into taking care of them to the point where it becomes um, obsessive. Oh. Um, 
I grew up in a industrial suburb of Parramatta and we had a, a view of the Shell Oil Refinery at Clyde and we didn't have much of a garden. My parents were British migrants and I think they grew up, they grew up during the Second World War and then migrated to Australia in the 50s and I think they had very modest ambitions and uh, that mostly didn't include gardening. But uh, my godmother who lived in Concord West was an absolutely fanatical gardener and grew uh, a lot of the plants that I still love today the, are things that I, I knew from uh, her garden as, uh, as a very young kid. Um, I was one of those nerdy kids at school who hung around the school library all the time and I was always uh, buried in books and not probably a socially a bit inept and I didn't like sport. And so I was one of those sort of outsider kids that um, you find pretty much everywhere. And um, books especially were a really a key part of my um, childhood and teenage years. And living in the imagination as you do, I think uh, was a, a really important aspect of uh, my teenage uh, life as well which is probably where I first encountered Francis Hodgson Burnett's The Secret Garden. Uh, although when I read it as a teenager, I possibly didn't have the sort of nuanced view of its underlying theme that James has just uh, outlined a moment ago. Um, when I was about 11 or 12, my parents took me to see Old Government House at Parramatta, which had just been newly restored for, uh, it must have been 1970 for the Cook Bicentennial. And um, I, I had no idea that houses like, colonial houses like Old Government House even existed up until that moment. So it was a, uh, an amazing awakening. And from the first day I went there, I became interested in colonial buildings and I spent all my spare time trying to search out every bit of information I could find about uh, colonial houses and, and dragging my parents all over the place to look at them. And um, I decided when I was about 11 that I was, I was going to be an architect. And that was a sort of obsession of mine right throughout my school, high school years. But surprisingly, not gardens. Um, eventually, I went to uh, Sydney University Architecture School. And I think in about the first or second term of design, we were asked to design a garden. And here, I found this the other day. Here's my first year, first, first year design scheme for a garden and I'm not I can't quite recall the circumstances but um, uh, at this stage I had zero interest in gardens and I, I'd never looked at a plant so you can see from the naive way I drew the plants in this uh, sketch that I didn't know anything about what I was doing um, but somehow during the course of doing this design exercise and later that year it was like a light bulb was turned on and I suddenly became transfixed by plants and gardens and um, gardening as a, as a practice, which I had never had any interest in before. And uh, I think I didn't, I had no idea about what garden design was. And the only thing I could think of was this walled garden from the secret garden, which was the only image I had of uh, a garden um, that could be translated into something. So here's my crazy scheme for a walled garden with a secret doorway on the left-hand side and these high walls. And then um, inside's quite weird. I think, I think Howard Tanner or Jennifer Taylor might have given a lecture about garden history or garden design. And I must have picked up on some of the, um, some of the cues because um, in the middle of this garden on a sort of terrace is this enormous boulder, which is supposed to be sitting on white gravel. And I suspect that must have been Jennifer Taylor talking about Japanese gardens because she was very keen on those um, raked uh, gravel gardens. And um, then at the top, what's really uh, interesting at the top is this sort of kooky chinoiserie sort of pavilion thing um, where I imagined that you'd go and sit in this pavilion and contemplate the view of this rock on um, gravel. And um, I suspect uh, Howard Tanner must have shown us some stuff in architecture history because that um, kooky chinoiserie pavilion seems to have a, a, a uncanny resemblance to this crazy folly that Lachlan Macquarie built at Newcastle Harbour, which you can see in the upper right-hand corner. Um, and so from that moment, uh, 
I guess my architecture career gradually came to an end because I, uh, it was taken over by plants and gardening yeah. and then eventually landscape architecture. Um, in about, uh, I think, 1979 or 1980, the National Trust uh, mounted this lovely exhibition at the SH Irvine Gallery about Hardy Wilson. And I don't think I'd ever heard of him before that, but I remember going to the exhibition and I've still got the catalogue, which is uh, a very beautiful catalogue with essays, essays by a number of authors, including Howard Tanner and James Broadbent amongst, and Caroline Simpson amongst others. And uh, of course, I thought the architecture was beautiful and the drawings were really very beautiful. But for the first time, uh, I became aware of this idea of um, colonial gardens having a particular character, a particularly identifiable character. And um, that was through reading those descriptions that Hardy Wilson wrote in um, the Cow Pasture Road book about his visits in the early 20th century to see um, colonial gardens, which were already uh, over mature and derelict. But he wrote very evocatively about the particular um, suite of plants that you find in colonial gardens, particularly in Western Sydney and the on the Cumberland Plain. And I'm sure they're plants that you're all familiar with, like uh, olives and um, figs. And he talks about periwinkles and roses and uh, a suite of plants which, uh, for me, characterise uh, a particular period in uh, garden history, but also uh, that are survivors. And we encounter them a lot in the work that I do now because they're, they're found in pretty much every colonial garden. And the other uh, feature of that exhibition and Hardy Wilson uh, that I hadn't been aware of before were, was to do with camellias and um, particularly prompted through um, his association with, uh, with uh, Professor Waterhouse, who was a great camellia enthusiast. So that triggered for me uh, an interest in um, camellias and particularly in 19th century camellias, which has continued right through to this day. And uh, as you can see from these photos uh, from uh, from Errolby and I'm, I'm actually really in love with stripes and bicolours, which were uh, incredibly popular in the 19th century, but less so now. Um, this slide is just a placeholder with some pretty flowers, so I could talk about some influences. I think we all have uh, key influences in our lives and often at early stages in our lives. And um, I, I found architecture school actually very challenging. And uh, for the most part, I didn't enjoy being there. It was a, a very difficult place to, to sort of traverse your way through. But the moments that stood out for me were um, particularly the lectures and design studios that were offered by Howard Tanner and, and also by Jennifer Taylor. And Howard, of course, had published a book about um, Australian, historic Australian gardens. And I think for his entire career, he's been interested in gardens and horticulture and uh, garden history. And he, he's a person who's been very generous in sharing his knowledge, his information and his resources with me and with many others um, right up until the, the present day. And um, at the same time was also Jennifer Taylor, who was an architectural lecturer, but who had a great interest in uh, European and Asian garden history and uh, also probably shaped my views about garden design for a long time. And so I think we were James who was there at the same time, we were very lucky to have exposure to those, um, to those people. Um, I met uh, Peter Valder very early on, who taught, he came and he used to come and give lectures in the architecture school, which were historically funny, but he also demonstrated a great love for plants and horticulture. And um, he had this sort of interest in the minutiae of, uh, of gardens and cultivating plants, which is something I, I picked up on and which I think is really important in the conservation of gardens. Yes. Um, uh, obviously, Alan Corrie, who, who was a landscape architect who taught in the architecture school and who later ran a landscape architecture degree course and who was a very charismatic uh, teacher. And uh, I was able to do some elective subjects in the School of um, Agronomy and Crop Science with uh, a lecturer whose name was uh, John Clemens, who taught environmental horticulture. and. He had a particular interest in, obviously, in, in crop production um, and particularly uh, horticultural crops, for example, uh, uh, cut fl for cut flower trade. So I think he was doing studies on long stem Bouvardia production and um, somebody else was doing um, citrus grafting. So you could achieve a maximum uniformity in citrus grafting. I, I did a research study on uh, 
the uh, variability and propagation of Australian rainforest trees, which was a thing I was interested in at the time. But he had a particular view of um, how to optimise plant performance in different environments, which I think, you know, it was related to, to um, crop production, but it's really useful looking at gardens and, and also in garden conservation, that in any place where you've got cultivated plants, there are uh, a range of limiting factors that prevent plants from being able to achieve their optimum performance and growth over time. And that, those factors can be things like soil, um, soil acidity, soil water, uh, soil structure, um, temperature range, the availability of sunlight, the availability of water, the presence of pests and diseases and pathogens, and competition between other plants. And the, I think it's a really um, useful way of looking at plants in gardens because it takes away the dimension of aesthetics and design as a consideration, and aesthetics and taste and design, and enables it allows you to look at um, the performance of plants in a more uh, objective and pragmatic way. And it's, it's stuck with me for all of these years. Um, so um, at the end of third year in architecture, you go away and have a holiday year and you're supposed to go and work in an office and get practical experience. But I was so damaged by the first three years that I didn't want to go back. And so my holiday year eventually turned into three years off when I probably grew up a bit. And then uh, in that time, Alan Corrie was starting up a new degree course in landscape architecture, which you could tack on to a, a preliminary degree. So I was accepted into that and did that degree course, which took another two and a half years. And on the left-hand side is the first cohort of students. Uh, where there were only five of us in that first intake. So it was a, it was a really nice environment to be, uh, to be studying because it was a very sort of personalised way of uh, working, particularly with Alan and also with Richard Lamb. Um, the slide, the picture on the right is uh, an extract from one of my field notebooks because Alan used to make us keep these um, notebooks about all the little excursions we wrote and we, we visited and you had to write little notes um, to remind yourself about um, what you were looking at. And um, I thought it was a very primary school thing to do, but he used to collect them at the end of each term and give you marks. And mine are all the, the red notes all the way through. Mine are always like, yeah, look, this is okay, but you could probably do quite a lot more. And I don't think you were very focused. Um, but why don't you go away and do some more research on that and tell me how you get on? Um, so it, 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 he was actually a great person to work with and a very um, charismatic teacher. He used to talk a lot uh, um, about the way that landscape design could be treated as quite a painterly, uh, uh, sort of painterly process, which I thought was a nice idea, but I probably never really understood it that clearly. And he was very enamoured of the work that Dame Sylvia Crow did in Canberra Commonwealth Gardens in the early 1960s, where she did this huge sort of coloured canvas using flowering shrubs and flowering trees to create a sort of impressionistic landscape. And um, he used to talk about it a lot, but I didn't really understand it maybe until about a year or two ago when I went in the middle of winter to Mount Lofty Botanic Garden, which Alan designed in the late 1960s. And there on this enormous scale with this sort of impressionist painting that he'd created using uh, just deciduous trees. And these are, these are all bare in the middle of winter, but still have this amazing um, color effect, um, which was the result of um, Alan's design uh, talent and ability, but also his incredible knowledge of plants and the way that they would perform in different circumstances. So that wonderful uh, combination of um, design and technical knowledge and curation that often, often produces um, amazing results. So I thought actually a very inspiring uh, way of looking at design. So I got my degree and I was really lucky to work in the government architect's office for quite a few years from about 19... 85 till the end of 1989. And he's um, a pretty callow at the time. I think Christine Murphy was working there at the same time and Gina Plata came a little while later. Uh, it was a great uh, place for a young landscape architect to work because there was so much work on offer that you were just given a bundle of projects to work on and you had to go away and do them. And um, also got to work with some other interesting people. I sat next to Michael Lahaney for about five years and Michael, shared an incredible amount of his uh, knowledge of, um, of the observation and study of historic gardens and landscapes. Mm -hmm. And in fact, one of my first projects was a hand-me-down from Michael, which was the recreation of a mid 19th century garden design for um, the Sydney Observatory. And it was probably the first time I'd 
encountered the idea of looking at original documentary sources. So we found some interesting um, plans from the 1850s and photographs from the 1870s and 1880s. And it was um, possibly the first time I'd ever looked at Loudoun and looked at sort of precedence in design. Um, and, but largely I was left to do this project uh, with, without very much supervision, which is a, a great opportunity for uh, a young landscape architect. And um, that was uh, the case on an, a number of things I worked on. Quite a lot of what, what we did was sort of schools and TAFE colleges and police stations and prisons. But in addition, there were some really lovely things that I worked on for a few years. And um, the next few slides are of uh, experience I had working for the Historic Houses Trust as a sort of um, garden advisory consultant. And uh, look, at that time in the early to mid 1980s, the Historic Houses Trust was really at the forefront of garden conservation probably in Australia, and certainly the research and study of historic gardens and uh, the knowledge of historic garden plants and garden plant conservation. And so I was really lucky to have exposure to um, people like Michael Lahaney and James Broadbent who had um, sort of struck new ground in that space. And uh, also Peter Watts, who was the first director of the Historic Houses Trust, was himself uh, incredibly interested in gardens and garden history. And so I think he had sort of made it as a a sort of key element of the work of the Historic Houses Trust that the gardens and horticulture had a sort of equivalent status to uh, the houses and interiors and the curation of the property, um, which uh, has carried them through to the present day. So they um, had a, they really um, initiated a, a lot of new practices that I learned from, which was the study of um, historical documentary sources and looking at the evidence on the ground and um, I worked with a couple of gardeners at Vaucluse House. First of all, um, Ivor Powell, an old, in, in, uh, an old English gardener who'd been there for many, many years. Irish, I think, actually, had been there for many years. And then subsequently with David Gray. And my role was really to help um, bring together that combination of um, horticulture, uh, the, the, the implementation of conservation objectives or conservation policies, and sort of curatorial vision for the site. And when those three things line up, you get a really fantastic result. So it was a, a really uh, lovely um, thing to work on. And then pretty much about the same time, I started doing a very similar practice for uh, Elizabeth Farm, originally with uh, Ross McClellan, I think was the garden gardener. And I think Elizabeth Farm was really groundbreaking when it first opened in 1984. And the garden was probably one of the first of the recreated museum gardens. Um, based on really careful historical analysis and uh, archaeological excavation done by Ted Higginbotham to reveal the main um, features in the driveway, et cetera. But then there was this wonderful planting overlay that had been developed by um, James Broadbent and Julie Whitfield and um, I think um, Michael Lahaney, which gave the place this character that's uh, so characteristic of uh, mid 19th century gardens in and around Sydney. And then a bit later on, uh, Historic Houses Trust then acquired Rouse Hill House, which was a really different proposition because uh, it was a place that was really sort of intact and almost in a way had been abandoned for some time. So the garden had become completely derelict and shambles. And the challenge uh, at this place was not to fix it up and make it, make it nice, but how to carefully conserve the, um, the sort of decayed and age character of it but whilst ensuring that it, it continued into the future. And I think I was at the very first conservation policy meeting for Rouse Hill House. And it, it, the garden figured really strongly in that discussion, not only the, not only the house and contents. Um, at the end of 1989, I went to live in England for a while. And um, by total fluke, I, I got a job with one of those very grand English lady garden designers, Arabella Lennox Boyd whose um, client list was like a who's who of faded European aristocracy and billionaire businessmen. And um, so they were, we had just had fantastic projects to work on, even though she was actually a very difficult, very demanding person to work for. And um, with um, landscape design projects, they often have a really long uh, lead time, you know, often from inception to completion, they may be three or four years. So in, in length, so you often find yourself inheriting other people's work. And in this project, which is a, a really large garden in Cheshire, uh, quite, a, quite a lot of landscape design had already been done. And when I walked in 
it was at the stage of um, bulk earthworks being installed. So I took over the contract administration and the site supervision of creating this very large new garden, um, which in this photograph is the terrace that's um, immediately in front of this uh, gigantic new house that the owners were building. Um, I was joking with Stephen Halliday and others earlier in this week that I'd actually never thought about soil um, in any meaningful way until I worked on this project. And, and, and the slides on the left, you can see all this brown stuff. And I uh, naively bought 6,000 cubic metres of this topsoil from a place near Manchester and had it delivered here. And then it developed some really terrible problems that took about six months to resolve. Um, which um, caused me great concern. I thought, I thought it was going to be the last job I ever worked on and that we were going to get sued. Um, and so from that moment on, I became incredibly fascinated by soil. And it's one of my pet subjects that whenever I talk to a gardener about a garden or a new owner, I always say to them, so what's the soil like? And usually people just shrug their shoulders and go, oh, I don't know, it's the soil. But um, it's, a, it's a moment where I became attuned to soil. Over about two years, we did several projects at this site, including a very large new rose garden, which is that garden on the lower terrace in the foreground. And uh, then I did a plan of management for this entire estate, which is about 85 acres of garden and parkland. And uh, that in itself was a, a great experience. And I used quite a lot of the knowledge and experience that I'd acquired from the Historic Houses Trust properties back in Australia. And uh, oh, look, here's an here's a illustration from Advino Brooks' uh, Gardens of England from the 1850s of this, that lower terrace in the 1850s, designed by Nesfield. And uh, the, original, the original owners was the first, were, were the fir was the first Duke of Westminster. And he had his initials, the W, engraved in parterre broderie with coloured gravel and um, red begonias, um, this gigantic scale in this, um, on this terrace, all, all long gone. Um, whilst I was working on the plan of management, I uh, spent quite a lot of time on this little garden, which was a, uh, another Nesfield uh, parterre with a beautiful 19th century um, dragon fountain in the middle of it, which had been largely dismantled at the, during the Second World War there and then partially reinstated, but not really um, correctly. And so um, I actually used quite a, a technique that Michael Lahaney had taught me uh, at Vaucluse House of analysing uh, old photographs and um, we, with this garden we we're fortunate that it had been uh, published in Country Life over and over many times so, so I was able to go to the Country Life um, archive and get the original uh, photographs enlarged and then uh, there's a sort of uh, analytical process you can do on photographs to work out dimensions and positions of key elements so I used that um, technique to work out what the configuration of the garden beds was and then subsequently we we reinstated that uh, earlier layout and moved the statuary items around to approximate the position that they were originally in. And um, all, you, all you really needed was one or two fixed elements that you were reasonably confident about. And in the Country Life photograph at the top, in, in about the middle of the, um, the garden in front of the tank, there are two blobs which are were, were, were uh, little blobs of you. And in my photographs from 1991 on the left-hand side, you can still see those blobs of view, which were still in place. So just with a tape measure, you could measure the distance between them and get a, an accurate dimension, which you could then use to scale off all the other dimensions in that garden. Uh, and so it was a sort of skills and experience that I learned here on relatively modestly scale gardens that we could use on a, a big project like that. Um, this is another, just one other example of a project I worked on in Italy, which was, creating a new garden around this villa, early 19th century villa, so not particularly important architecturally. And we, uh, on the lower right hand side is my kooky design for sort of faux, it's a sort of sub Jeffrey Jellicoe, faux, you know, Baroque, Villa Itati style uh, um, Italian garden, which was only partially implemented. But um, one of the, the fun thing about this project, which went on for about two years was um, the sort of conservation work you can do without a conservation plan in place. And I, I basically went to the site every six weeks or so and would stay for three or four days. And they had, they had all their own staff. So if you needed to rebuild a brick wall, 
they had masons, so you could just you could just describe what you wanted them to do, and they had a sort of traditional knowledge of building materials and construction, so they just they do it. And uh, so over time, we were able to put in order the all these wonderful driveways and um, prune all the holm oak trees and clear out all the gutters and reconstruct, um, uh, reposition all the bollards, etc. And um, one of the really nice things about working in Italy is that the weather's really good. So if you're based in London, which is miserable a lot of the time, going to um, going to Tuscany for a few days in the middle of winter, even in the middle of winter, would be lovely. Uh, and the architect on this project who was based in Siena was a complete Anglophile. So every time I went there for a site visit, he'd take me out to show me things around the vicinity, which was a, a great um, sort of learning experience. Um, but otherwise, my work in London was a lot of this sort of stuff, you know, box balls in terracotta pots and um, clipped yew hedges and topiaried um, standard uh, Russian olives and uh, a very sort of ultimately very boring sort of garden. But uh, none, none, nonetheless, you know, we, we did a lot of them and they become, they become a sort of um, standard that unfortunately, I think I've grown away from it now, but at the time it seemed like a lot of fun. Um, I mentioned Jellico, and I've always been in love with these drawings for, uh, of Italian gardens by Geoffrey Jellico, and I often tried to emulate this, um, this sort of style that he did with watercolours and ink, but I, I did with coloured pencil, not, not very successfully, but they were quite, quite useful for, um, I've jumped forward one. Oop. Um, during that time I was in that office in London, I think I spent an awful lot of time buried in these books which uh, I think everyone's probably got in their bookcase. And uh, particularly the, the uh, David Ottawa book on Edwardian Gardens, which I still think is one of the best books on um, garden design and garden history ever written. And uh, quite a lot of the work that we did in that practice, I would say, was a sort of um, subpar Harold Peter or Charles Edward Mallow's formality, and then cloaked with the sort of rich planting that Russell Page did later in the century. And so we, the whole practice was forever, um, you know, um, busily burying our way through these books, looking at illustrations and then copying details in projects that we were working on. Um, I used, um, when I was working on the Eaton Hall Garden doing that conservation, that plan of management, I realised that the attributions in uh, Jane Brown's book about that garden were wrong. So I, I phoned her up and, you know, very cheekily said, oh, look, I think you got that wrong which she didn't appreciate at all. And uh, when I said, I, well, so I, like, I went back to the original sources, she was sort of scratching her head going, look, what, but why would you? I just went to Pevsner and copied whatever was in Pevsner. So such was the sort of credibility of Pevsner still at that, in that age. So um, then in um, early 1992, I came back to Sydney somewhat unexpectedly and uh, into a recession. So there were no jobs for landscape architects and I was very lucky to get a, a newly created role in the Royal Botanic Gardens, more in a sort of horticultural collections and thematic planning um, purpose than design per se. But over time, I sort of was able to implement um, more uh, sort of design ideas and, and then gradually introduce ideas about heritage conservation and conservation practice. Um, one of the really fun things at Botanic Gardens was doing these enormous bedding displays. And Sydney has this fantastic climate for tropical, subtropical garden-esque, which in the UK or France, you can only do for a few weeks each summer. And um, so in these schemes that I gradually developed, there's a lot of references to um, 19th and early 20th century English schemes, like the one on the right, uh, which, which is actually in Scotland. And um, they were uh, very successful because they were a move away from um, mass displays of petunias, etc. And displays like this one I did around the Karajic Monument have quite a lot of perennial material in them. So you can make them last sort of six or six months or even longer without changing the stock over. And unfortunately, bedding displays are very labor intensive. So most gardens nowadays don't have the luxury of the resource to be able to do them. Um, I just thought I'd chuck this in for the plant lovers. Like, apart from the, the scientific collections, which are of course the mainstay of the Botanic Garden, they're incredibly rich in horticultural plants and it was a great joy being able to work with that material. And, uh, you know, if I wanted 5,000 of something propagated, I didn't have to worry about finding it in a nursery because I could just get the propagator to grow them. 
Uh, and so we were able to do uh, quite um, interesting horticultural displays just with our own resources and using our own nursery and um, nursery facilities and gradually getting the horticultural staff used to this um, uh, quite sort of luxuriant style of planting. Um, there are a number of projects underway when I went there, one of which was Professor Chambers' um, herb garden, which uh, he'd already designed and it was sort of half built and then construction had come to a standstill and the project had been criticised in the press and by the Premier. So it was a, quite a troubled um, development and I, I took it on midway through and developed up the thematic plan for the uh, planting layout and the interpretive concept for um, the sort of an interpretation of herbs in uh, different, well, different aspects of the growth, growing of herbs for different purposes. And we, we focused a lot, uh, not uh, just on culinary herbs, but also on industrial use of plants and the reliance of um, humans on plants in general. And uh, um, the, the photograph on the right is actually a, a garden by Russell Page somewhere in, I think, in Switzerland. And I think you can probably still see there's a slight, um, I, I was probably still paying a little homage to, uh, you know, European precedents. And with the garden bench below, I think the garden bench on the right is designed by Charles Edward Mallows, an English um, Edwardian garden designer. And the one, of the, the one that we built is a sort of variation on that, but based on a a photograph of a, a, ben, a bench that was in the Botanic Gardens in the late 19th century. Um, during the time I was at uh, the Royal Botanic Gardens, we also had control of uh, the garden at Government House, which is actually a very tricky proposition. It's, uh, you know, as an official residence and with a, an official program of events, gardening there is always a balancing act of working in between major events and the sort of major renovations only happen in periods when the house um, has very little use. And when I first went there, there was a very traditional approach to bedding and flower displays and floral presentation. But um, the photograph on the right, at uh, the top right, is the old head gardener, Hans van der Jucht, who was a, a Dutch florist. And he'd learned his trade growing uh, flowers for the cut flower market. And, and he had a great love of annuals. So you could say to Hans, look, there's an event on you know, the 23rd of September, and uh, we need the floral display to be at its peak. And um, Hans could work out exactly what date in March you needed to sow the seeds and what phase of the moon to get um, 15,000 plants all flowering at the same time, uh, which is, I think, a skill that doesn't really exist in, um, in horticulture much anymore. And he grew everything in these nasty cold frames that were in the depot. Uh, at the back of Government House. He didn't use any sterile media. Um, his hygiene practices were appalling. His plant hygiene practices were appalling. He would mass sow seeds and have mass germination and a 100% success rate every time. So a really great guy to work with. And once he got interested in the sort of approach I had, say, to these perennial borders on the left-hand side, he was really enthusiastic about um, implementing them and showing them off once they were successfully in flower. Um, I also worked on a redevelopment of a part of the garden near the Koi Kart Pond and the restaurant floor oriental collection, um, which was because the, the botanists had been amassing a very large collection of East Asian plant material, but hadn't really thought about how to display it in the garden. So this was probably one of the last things I um, ever designed before the Institute of Landscape Architects said I would never be able to be a proper landscape architect. And, uh, and it, was great. it was great fun to do because we built it ourselves. Again, in the gardens, there was a little landscape team who were really keen, all really young guys who were really keen on stone masonry. So they did all the stonework themselves, um, all the timber construction. And then our nursery manager had uh, propagated up all the right uh, quantities of um, plant material. So it was, it was sort of fully, fully furnished from the day it opened. And, um, it was a garden that also appealed to sponsors and we got quite a large sponsorship from the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank who were very interested in the idea of um, plant collecting in the wild and uh, plant conservation in botanic gardens worldwide, of which this was a really good example. Um, as years went by at the botanic gardens, I got uh, more and more involved in sort of asset and infrastructure uh, 
uh, maintenance and development. So for example, we did a really major reconstruction of the seawall around Farm Cove and quite a lot of uh, refurbishment and conservation work on gates and monuments. Um, and increasingly, uh, a lot of the work I did moved into uh, um, the management of urban trees, uh, particularly in the domain, which has a very large number of senescent and over mature trees. And so Alistair Hay, the horticultural botanist and I, I think started to develop quite a recognised um, expertise in the management of um, uh, senescent trees and in um, whole of life cycle planning for tree replacement in cultural landscapes. Um, tree removal is actually a very emotive uh, thing for most people in the community. So it, it was very shocking um, for many people when we started saying we wanted to cut down 140 year old, 150 year old fig trees. And uh, some of you may recall, we had a, had a huge row with the city of Sydney and Clover Moore about the removal of some really decrepit fig trees in Hospital Road and the process of um, designing a replacement and sourcing uh, suitable material for that. Um, but in fact, that work on, on trees was actually probably what set me up for my subsequent role at Centennial Park. Um, we also, I, I also gradually moved more into uh, conservation of built elements like uh, some of the cottages um, and the adaptive reuse, reuse of other buildings like the little early 20th century toilet block that we turned into a shop. And I was pretty closely involved in the redevelopment of the conservatory and music and the Greenway Stables building, trying to ensure that the Botanic Gardens got the, the best result out of that. And so increasingly, in, in 2004, I think, uh, 2004, I was able to get the first ever conservation management plan done for the Royal Botanic Gardens, which was a, a really uh, amazing thing to work on with a great team, which included um, Colleen Morris and Richard Aitken and um, um, Connie Ben Morrison and Craig Burton. Uh, and we established not only the significance of the garden layout and the built elements, but also the, uh, the plant collections. And Professor David Mabberley worked with me and I think with Stuart Reid on trying to define criteria for significance of the historic trees in the gardens, uh, which hadn't been done before. And we also looked at quite a lot of the built elements like the, the various cottages and the depot buildings and uh, talked about their significance in their own right for the first time. Um, after about 12 years, I started to get itchy feet because I, I started to feel like I, I belong, I become a possession of the Botanic Gardens. It sort of takes over your life and you end up feeling like it owns you, which I became a bit resentful about. So I started looking around for other opportunities and this is on my very last day where they, they let me plant a commemorative tree, which is a, a very rare occurrence. So, you know, commemorative trees are usually for visiting dignitaries or premiers, but uh, this is a, a really rare um, a cowrie pine from far north Queensland, it grows up on the Dick's Tableland at about a thousand metres altitude, but also grows in Sydney. And it's the first one that we'd ever planted in Sydney. And I think still there uh, 15 years later. So that was a success. And then um, luckily I'd a lot, quite a lot of that experience I'd had with asset management and uh, built assets and conservation then allowed me to move to Centennial Park for a while, which is another Charles Moore landscape as with the Botanic Gardens. Um, and uh, whilst my role was across all the assets and in, in increasing built assets and infrastructure, a really major component of that role was around tree management. Um, Centennial Park itself has about um, three and a half thousand trees uh, and the three parks, Centurion Park, Moore Park and Queens Park all together have about 6,000 trees, 95% of which are figs, palm oaks, areas, and paperbarks. And so there are enormous problems with crop monocultures that you find in cultural landscapes like this. And the parklands had had a really terrible disaster with uh, Phoenix, um, Phoenix date palms, Canary Island date palms in the uh, mid 1990s when they had all succumbed to a fungal disease with the consequence that the, they were they disappeared completely from the park landscape. So we started looking at um, tree uh, life cycle planning for the entire uh, parkland collection. And they, they had quite a good tree master plan, which talked a lot about experimentation uh, as Charles Moore himself had experimented at the end of the 19th century. 
Um, and here, so as a result, I actually spent a lot of time cutting, cutting trees down. We, we cut down about 300 trees a year in uh, Centennial Park, but we kicked off a tree planting program where we were, we were planting about 500 new ones each year. And um, the reason I put the, uh, the, the scorched wasteland on the right was to show you what the parklands landscape was like before uh, Charles Moore and James Jones uh, worked their magic on it. So it was basically sand with rock outcrops. And so a really very difficult environment to grow trees in successfully and which um, had contributed to a lot of the um, environmental performance issues that um, trees suffered from. And, and so going back to those comments I made about John Clemens, Dr. John Clemens, really early on about looking at the, how the environmental factors can limit the successful growth and performance of plants. Then um, after a few years, it was a bit, uh, I worked a lot in asset management at, at Centennial Parklands and uh, Historic Houses Trust was going through a sort of uh, renewal phase with a new director and I was recruited into a sort of asset management role there. Uh, which, which covered uh, sort of conservation, um, asset management, but also gardens and landscapes. So in a way it was a return to first base. Uh, and although I have uh, less time to spend on gardens um, now, but still have uh, still potter around a little bit from time to time. And one of the really nice things about uh, Historic Houses Trust is the way of, well, even from its inception, they've always wanted to try new things and for the last few years, we've been pushing our um, research and investigation into modernism in Australia uh, and modernist houses in particular. And the, the house in the upper right hand corner is uh, Harry Seidler and Penelope Seidler's house at Kalara, um, one of many that we've looked at. And uh, they also have uh, really interesting gardens uh, of a particular type and character, which is uh, very easily lost and very easily uh, muddled. So, it's a sort of opportunities to uh, strike out into new territory, but continuing, continuing to use those sort of practices and um, research processes and investigation that was the hallmark of Historic Houses Trust right from its uh, beginning. Um, we st I still do do a little bit of gardening. So this week, earlier this week, I was with Steve Halliday and the, uh, the rest of the gardens team in the Pleasure Garden, um, pruning roses and talking about soil, which is uh, still my favorite topic. And a few weeks ago, we, we did a, a working bee with my heritage team uh, and all the gardens team and myself on bush regeneration in Olala Avenue, uh, which is a really ongoing challenge for that um, site. And so really fantastic to still be able to work in that environment and be associated with plants in that way. And um, uh, I guess I'm 61. I might have a few more years still to go in my working life. So there's still other things I have to achieve in that space. For a really long time, I've been interested in um, cemeteries. And in Australia, it struck me a long time ago that there's this very interesting character of many Australian cemeteries, which is related to um, perceptions of Arcadia or visions, um, you know, 19th and 20th century visions of Arcadia translated into a sort of Australian um, idiom. And uh, so the photos on the left are of, of Rookwood Cemetery, obviously. Um, and on the right are uh, in Greece, which I've been going to a lot for holidays. And often when I'm in Greece out of sight, I'll suddenly think, oh, I've seen that in Sydney. And uh, it strikes me that, and uh, a, a conversation I've had with Scott Hill many times, one of our curators, is the, the way that Arcadian uh, visions of Arcadia crop up a lot in descriptions of colonial properties and colonial sites. And um, there, it's a, uh, Arcadian characteristics are also a feature of many paintings of um, colonial landscapes, such as these ones on the right, I think by Conrad Martins and um, George Edwards Peacock. And so uh, in the last few years, I've been going to Greece uh, pretty much every year, and I've visited Arcadia several times. And uh, the photograph on the left is in um, the middle of Greece uh, at a monastery site and uh, quite often you turn a corner and you think, oh, that's really, that's really just like Walkaloo's house or oh, that's, that's really just like um, the slope at uh, Rouse Hill House. And uh, uh, I think there's a really strong um, historical connection that must have played out quite strongly in 19th century imagination. Um, I think I've got one more slide. Um, going to Greece is a uh, plant lover's dream because uh, 
not only are the native plants of Greece really incredible, um, there are lots of things that you know from gardens. So seeing, seeing plants that you've only known in cultivation and gardens in Australia growing in the wild is uh, just wonderfully exciting. And the top left-hand photo is uh, Euphorbia shiraceus, which is, has many, many different forms. And in Greece, it's a wildflower that grows along roadsides in gravel. And uh, so it's, it's a quite, it's very exciting when you see it for the first time. I think, oh, of course, that's how that grows. And then explain so much about why it behaves the way it does in gardens. And on the lower left-hand corner is Acanthus growing on a cliff top in Lesbos, literally metres away from the ocean and absolutely thriving, which is not a thing. I've, I always sort of naively thought of it as a woodland plant that needed shade, but in Greece, it grows in the most exposed um, locations. And um, all over Greece, there are old roses, particularly 19th century roses. The one at the top, I think, is um, Paul's Scarlet Pillar, which is a 19th century rose that's not grown much in Australia. And the lower one is Duchesse de Brabant, which is in almost every garden all over central Greece. And uh, the right-hand photo is a little garden uh, owned by some friends of mine who live in Kithra that I've been sort of advising on for maybe about the last 10 years. And one of the um, really charming things about that place has been gradually weaning the owners off bougainvilleas and hibiscus and getting them interested in the native plants and old plants like roses. And we've often gone on forays to abandon uh, properties and dug up old rose bushes and brought them to this garden. So it's now, uh, it's now got the sort of character of a Greek traditional garden, but with a sort of um, modern tinge to it in the design and layout. And here's my last slide, which is a garden um, you, many of you have probably visited. It is at uh, Throsby Park in Moss Vale. For me, it's, it's, it's um, the most charming um, country garden I can imagine. And unlike every, everything else in the Southern Highlands, it's, it's utterly unpretentious. You know, there, there aren't any magnolias or rhododendrons or Japanese maples or rare perennials. It's, um, there's some old elm trees and some uh, old cotoneasters and um, a few irises, but just very little. And just with uh, the most bare of, um, of resources, it creates this very beautiful landscape. And so that's where I'm going to leave it, walking out the back gate at Throsby Park. So I'll stop sharing. Thank you. James, back to you. Thanks, Ian. That was amazing. I have asked um, Christine Hay who to close tonight, and I think she will thank you formally. So, Christine. Yeah. Thank you, James. Uh, and thank you, Ian. Uh, well, you when you opened, you said that um, we may be bored um, by your talk, but I can assure you that was not the case. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, oh, sorry, I'm just having a few computer issues there. Um, that was uh, incredible um, to, it was incredible to watch that presentation, get an understanding of uh, all those uh, influences that have underpinned your amazing career uh, and have led you to this um, great understanding of uh, landscape heritage and, um, and your uh, heritage conservation practice. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm so glad we have recorded that uh, session um, because I'm sure many people will watch it again and again. It uh, was so rich. Um, look, I just, so much I enjoyed about that. I really, um, particularly uh, about learning about uh, Alan Corrie's course at Sydney Uni yeah. and um, how he taught and, and, uh, and sorry, and before that, seeing uh, the, uh, your early sketches with gardens. <laughs> and hearing about um, Howard Tanner and Jennifer Taylor and their influence. But yeah, and uh, there's so much to say. And uh, I mean, what haven't you worked on, Ian? That's what I want to know. <laughs> and where haven't you worked? <laughs> so it's, um, and funnily enough, I also worked in at the landscape section at um, state, um, state government, but in a similar time, but I just, 
don't ever remember sort of crossing paths with you. Um, I think um, you might have left to go travelling and I actually took your role. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it was a beautiful unfolding. Thank you, Ian. Thank you and much. it was a humble, you were humble in your presentation. You were very honest and you shared a lot. And particularly, you know, you, you shared, yes, you shared your successes, but also some, you shared uh, how things can go wrong and, yeah. and you know, about soil and how, um, <laughs> yeah, and how that sort of led you into another direction. And I really respect um uh, you know, that your approach and also learning about your approach to plants and the, that functional and practical mm -hmm. approach that you have um, and the rigor of your research as well. I really, um, I really respect um, how you um, want to get to the bottom of um, things and yeah. when you're recreating if that's the case the gardens and also what you learnt from Michael Lahaney that was uh, really fascinating mm -hmm. so I mean I could really um, there's a lot to say uh, about your talk and I'm sure we'll all be talking about it and I also just finally enjoyed those uh, uh, insights into the visions of Arcadia that was great oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. traveling, traveling around, you know, Greece, uh, Italy, yeah. um, Britain. Wow. So yeah. that was a very um, worthy talk of, for our AGM. And we, all of us, I'm, I, I, um, I hope I'm speaking for everybody here tonight, uh, just to thank you very much for all that work that you put into that presentation and um, very enjoyable. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. I really yeah, yeah. the feedback. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm going to just um, say uh, wrap up tonight. And um, I've just got a few things to say. So um, it'd be great if you um, just um, stayed around for a little while. Um, so tonight we heard how four of our members um, of our Sydney branch committee are leaving. So um, I want to just um, take a moment to thank James, Gina and Angela and Tempe for their time um, on the committee. Their camaraderie has been um, you know, something very special and uh, their friendship and um, their trust on the committee has been it's been a, just a, a wonderful um, to, it's been wonderful to have that time with them. And I hope I'm speaking for all of the committee members um, at the moment. So um, as James mentioned, they, uh, James, Gina and Angela have each spent 10 years on the committee, uh, Tempe six years, that's a lot of time. In that time, James was um, chair and also secretary and, um, Tempe was um, vice chair and uh, secretary as well. And um, uh, Gina has been involved in the editorial committee, involved in YASMA, and uh, Angela has um, she's been involved in so many organizing our talks, but also doing a fantastic job uh, leading the charge with the catering. Um, but tonight, um, I'm we're not going to talk um, a lot further about this because we hope to celebrate these wonderful people in style at our Christmas party. So you'll learn more about that later. That's on the 6th of December as mentioned tonight. But the, while this is sad news for the committee, what's great news is that uh, James, Gina and Angela will continue on on the Sydney uh, Conference Committee. So that's great. But so for our um, Sydney branch committee, it will be a great uh, time of renewal um, as we um, recalibrate and uh, work out our um, direction or, and uh, also, you know, a look at how we can um, support the conference. So um, 
on a final note, uh, the conference, as you've probably heard, is on the, I'll just tell you what the dates are, you may know, but uh, the dates for the 2021 conference are from the 10th of September, Friday the 10th of September, through to Monday the 13th of September. And of course, we'll have our pre-registration events on the 9th of September. So we, uh, on the behalf of the uh, Sydney Branch Committee and the Sydney um, uh, Conference Planning Committee, we, we will welcome you, know, you to um, attend our conference uh, in that time. And we are all so excited that we have been able to transfer our, you know, designed uh, events across to these dates. And uh, it will be, um, yeah, it's, we're just really looking forward to delivering our Sydney 2021, uh, um, what is the name? Many Dreams, One Landscape. So uh, tonight I just want to finish up and say give our heartfelt thanks to Ian and uh, our, our great thanks to the committee members who are leaving and thank you all for who have come along tonight and, and listened to, to it and listened to our AGM. And um, yeah, I um, officially draw the uh, evening to a close. So thank you everyone. Uh, if anyone's got anything to say, that's fine too, if you'd like to have any comments. Um, yes, I'd like to know who were the first five students in the landscape architecture course and what happened to them, <laughs> apart from Ian? <laughs> um, uh, Richard Downs, who's a, a builder. Um, Paul Knox, who's the principal of Paul Knox and Associates. Um, Ian Armstrong, who I think is uh, still practicing in landscape architecture, and John O'Grady, who's who is uh, a planner now. Thank you. And me. I love the talk. I only wish I was ten years younger. I would have done it myself. <laughs> I ended up in biology. <laughs>
I've got oh, yeah. yeah, I've got forty pictures on the yes. USB. So yeah. will I plug that in now? Yes. Okay. Right, that's in. Yep, and then um, if you can open open your what? Are you able to? Can you see where it says share screen? Um, yes. So click on that. Yeah. Right. Okay. Desktop, whiteboard, whatever. Still there? Yeah. I'm, yeah. I can't see anything yet. Oh. oh You've okay. obviously got it on your screen. I well, I I've got desktop. I've got whiteboard, phone, iPad. Um, hmm. Right. Can you try and open up the file of images? Um, well, what should I do? Press desktop, do you reckon? Would that help? Yes. Um, what have you got on your screen? I can see it sort of in your glasses. <laughs> yeah, I can see. Allow Zoom to share your screen. Open yeah. preferences. Press so that. I'll click on that. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. We're back. Right, zoom us, um, contacts, calendars, reminders, photos, camera. Um, mm. Maybe, do you want to, maybe on the evening of the AGM, mm -hmm. if you have, have the file ready to go or open at the first slide, Right. Um, and then join in the meeting. And then when you share your screen, it should just come up. Mm, do you reckon? Ooh, okay. Um, is there going to be another trial on the on uh, Friday? On Friday, yeah. Should we do it then? Yeah, we could do it then. That might be better. Yeah. I mean, I'd like, you know, I mean I'm, I've got them up on the screen, but I've never connected them with the... All oh, right. So why can't you share it now with no, me? I don't, know. don't ask me. <laughs> I mean, there's a sign up saying Zoom US. Zoom.